that's the good stuff, folks. Amen, amen, amen. All right. Well, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 27 with me this morning, please. Verse number 26. Matthew chapter number 27 and verse number 26. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus to the common hall, gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. When they planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. They bowed the knee before him, mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spit upon him, took the reed, and smote him on the head. And after that, they mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he'd tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots, and sitting down, they watched him there. Father, bless your holy word, Lord, as it goes forth now. Bless this messenger in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, folks, that is, that is as historical an account as uh, when Columbus came over here in 1492 and went down to the Caribbean. This is a fact. It happened 2,000 years ago. He was crucified. The man Christ Jesus is attested to by a number of secular historians, a number of them. We'll get into all that this morning, but I'm not going to try to prove to you that Christ was here. He was, no question. And he's coming again. They put an inscription over his head, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. These, of course, are languages that represent separate cultures. Hebrew is the ancient of all of them, the most ancient. Bullinger says probably the most ancient of all languages, and I tend to agree with him. It has no fountainhead. It has no source. It's a source unto itself. Hebrew's a pure language that the Lord said in Zephaniah that I'll restore unto you. Latin, of course, is the language of the Romans, the Roman Empire, and Greek was the language of culture and commerce of that day. And we New Testament that you're reading was written in what's called Koine Greek, which is the common Greek of the people 2,000 years ago. The crucifixion was something that took place publicly. The reason for this is because it was an act of terror by the state. The idea was to bring the people into submission by literally scaring them to death, allowing them to watch someone as they hung upon a tree, a cross, and suffered an unspeakable suffering and then die. We get the word excruciating pain. It literally means pain coming forth from the cross. That's what it means, excruciating. And then, my friend, in 132 A.D., a man by the name of Bar Kokhba, he led a Jewish revolt against Rome. They, they, it was so, so well known and so organized that they struck coins in his name that you can find to this day. Bar Kokhba was the shining star. Here's what it says. During the revolt, the Jewish sage Rabbi Akiba regarded Simon, this is Bar Kokhba, as the Jewish Messiah, even though they had rejected the true Messiah, they have followed more than one false Messiah. The Talmud records his statement that the star prophecy, and this prophecy is from Numbers, chapter 24, verse 17, and that, that scripture says this, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. Israel was constantly looking for someone to throw off the yoke of oppression from an empire for whoever to throw it off, to get rid of it so they could 
uh, once again rule themselves. And so Bar Kokhba attempted to do this. It referred to him, Rabbi Akiva said, based on identification of the Hebrew word for star, Kokhba, or Bar Kosiva. The name Bar Kokhba, which references this statement of Akiva, does not appear in the Talmud, but only in ecclesiastical sources till the 16th century. The Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud mention him by the name of Bar Kosiva. You'll hear a lot out of me about the Talmud because a Jew does not reject Christ based on the Word of God, the Tanakh. He rejects Christ based on the Talmud. And the Talmud in many places is one of the most wicked things ever written by a human being. Some of the things that you'll find in the Talmud will blow your mind. And the Talmud is what they use today to reject the Son of God, not the Bible. The killing of Bar Kokhba and the subsequent defeat of his rebels yielded disastrous consequences for Judea's Jewish population. Even more so, the crackdown that had taken place during and after the first Jewish-Roman War. Based on archaeological evidence, ancient sources, and contemporary analysis, between five and 600,000 Jews are estimated to have been killed in the conflict. This is one of many times the Jews have literally been practically wiped out from their own country. Now, this is important, what I'm about to give you. Because this brings you to contemporary times. It brings you to what's happening right now in Israel, a place they call Palestine. Hadrian was the Roman ruler at this time, was the emperor, Hadrian. He built a wall that separated the northern part of, of England from the southern part, from the Picts in the north and those in the south. It's called Hadrian's Wall. It's still standing. You can go over there today and see it. That thing's 2,000 years old. He crucified thousands of Jews all over the place. He changed the name of Israel to Palestina. He changed the name of Jerusalem to Elia Capitolina. He greatly depopulated Judea. He forbade Jews from entering into Jerusalem. He built a Cardo Maximus through the center of town and he sacrificed a swine on an altar in Jerusalem. Anything he could do to deface, demean, and destroy Jewish identity. Hadrian took it upon himself to eliminate the Jew from the face of the earth and drive them from their land. And there's where the word Palestine had its origin in the land. God called it the Holy Land. He called it the land of Israel. He does not call it Palestine. And you know that now. That this is an historical thing that I'm giving you this morning. So this doctrine that I'm preaching to you this morning is about the cross, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said, cursed is every one that hangeth upon a tree, separated from God, separated from the earth, hung in the middle between the two, my friend. The doctrine of the cross is the power of its message. 1 Corinthians 1, 17, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. When you think about that cross, think about the creator of the universe. Think about the one who spoke worlds into existence, simply breathed into clay and he became a living man, a man from the very soul of almighty God. Think about one with that power and yet here he manifests himself in a different and entirely different way. He dies on a cross. Can you imagine the angel, the seraphim, the cherubim, the watchers and all the powers that could be observing this? I wonder what they thought. God does not take counsel with his creatures when he decides to do something. When he gets ready, he does it. And I want you to know something today. You'll learn more about God Almighty through Christ until he makes him known to us than you will anywhere else. The Son reveals the Father. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 12 said, As many as desire to make a fair show of you in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should, be, uh, lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. The cross has never, ever, ever been accepted. All relics of the cross... Pieces of the cross. And I wear a cross. And we have a cross here. There's nothing wrong with that. But my dear friend, when I preach the cross of Christ, I'm not preaching this or I'm not preaching this. I'm preaching the cross of 2,000 years ago that he died on and shed his blood so that we could be saved. Galatians 6, 14. 
The apostle said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. So the cross itself becomes an instrument that separates, and it does separate. And the cross becomes an instrument that identifies, and it does identify. And the cross becomes a place where God meets with man, and he does meet with man. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached, <coughs> excuse me, unto you which also you've received and wherein you stand, but which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, lest you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is not money. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is not health, wealth. The gospel of Christ is not church buildings. The gospel of Christ is not people. The gospel of Christ is not works. My friend, it is not catechisms. The gospel of Christ is not a religion. The gospel of Christ is separate completely and totally. It's all about a man, Christ Jesus, amen. If there is no cross, there is no gospel. If there is no blood, there is no gospel. If there is no sin bearer, there is no gospel. If there is no burial, there is no gospel. And if there be no resurrection, then there be no gospel, amen. So if it's not the death and the burial and the resurrection of the sinless one, my friend, you're preaching another gospel. And you can get plenty of it in this country. You can go from one church to the next. You'll find it everywhere. Walk through the door and they'll make you feel good about yourself before you leave that place. And my friend, the gospel is not about making you feel good about yourself. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also the Greek. The gospel of Christ is what you need. The gospel of Christ is what your marriage needs. The gospel of Christ is what your children need. It's what your family needs. It's what you need. The gospel of Christ is the only thing that can handle that sin problem that's eating you alive today. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, it's the power of that place. Look at Ephesians 2.16 that he might reconcile both into God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. God reconciles himself unto man. Nowhere in that Bible from Genesis to Revelation will you ever read where God reconciles himself to angels or cherubim or seraphim or any spiritual creature, only to the man. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Colossians chapter number one and verse number 20 says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven to be brought back to God. Where? At the cross, not the church, not religion, not good works, not mean well. At the cross, that's the only place a man can meet God and you meet him at the cross. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. How does that go? Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, I preach deep things sometimes. Sometimes I'll skim around on the surface. Sometimes I'll give you what little bit that's been revealed to me about these things. And I thank God for what little he has showed me. But some of the stuff that I'll preach to you this morning is much, much, much deeper than it appears on the surface. This, for example, the reconciliation. We've been reconciled unto God. Man and God were brought together at the cross. What does that mean? That's powerful. That's a deep thing. To it, God was in Christ reconciling the world. It was at the cross that the power of Satan is destroyed. It is at the cross that the power of sin is destroyed. It is at the cross that the vast gulf between God and man is breached at the cross. Amen. Yes, sir. At the cross. Oh, yeah. And the power of his person is seen at the cross. Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 8. Being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, the accursed death of the cross. Cursed is everyone. He could have died many different ways, or maybe he could not have. But I know one thing's for certain. He had to lay his life down. No man took it from him. 
if he had pleased, he could still be on that cross 2,000 years later. Amen. But he gave up the ghost after six hours and said, Father, into thy hands, I come in my spirit. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. What joy? Can you imagine? Born into a wicked world. Born in sins and trespasses. Lost without God. Blind as a bat, my dear friend. And yet he came to me. And there he, he redeemed me. And he bought me. He saved me. He wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life. And one day I'll glorify him in glory. Hallelujah to God. That'll bring joy to him. It ought to bring joy to us tonight. Yes, it does. So the Bible said in Hebrews 12, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. It is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The reason he sat down is because it's finished. It's finished. It's finished. I would that all religions would get a good dose of that. It's he doesn't need your good works. Your good works are fine, but that has nothing to do with your salvation. You're not going to work your way to glory. You say, well, I'm a good person. That's still not going to do the job. You're not good enough. If your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the Pharisee, how do you think you're going to make it? And he said, when he came to this world, I came not to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. Well, preacher, you mean there are some? No, my friend, look carefully at it. The text is very clear. He plays on words. He puts them out there to you to make you think there is none righteous. No, not one, that Bible says. In plain words, he said, you see the righteous stand on the corner. You see the Pharisee. You see him pray his big, long prayers. Look at his robes. He's, he's manifesting his righteousness to you. Look at that. That appears to be righteous. He said, but no, my friend, it is nothing in the world more than dead men's bones. It's a white as sepulcher, empty inside and dead. The power of his person can be seen in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Forgive them. They didn't appreciate that. But here on the cross at Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ had no hatred. And no condemnation. He's given himself for us, dying for our sins. No, what's coming forth from him? Love, 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 love. He laid down his life. First Corinthians chapter number 13. If you go read it and study it, pray over it, you'll get the Bible definition of love. What the Bible says about love. Love, my dear friend, will bring a marriage together that can never be broken. Love will join husbands and wives and sons and daughters. It'll join family members together that cannot be broken. Nothing can sever it. The real love of God is the strongest thing on the face of this earth. People can, they, a lot of people live for doctrine. They live for the fight. They live, for, they live for, the, for the road, for the run. But my friend, let me tell you something. There's something greater than that. That's the love of God. Love. Real love. You say, well, now, preacher, I love myself. Don't you think that's good enough? Well, that's a problem right now. You've been, you have been pampered to death. Let me be honest with you. There's nothing about you that should be loved. You're not lovable. According to the Bible, none of us are lovable. But he still loves us. Why? Because he loves us with the love of God. The love of God. The love of God. He made this creature. He made this creature to have fellowship with him. He made this creature to talk to him. He made this creature to pray to him. He made this creature that could respond to him in a way that no angel, cherubim, seraphim could ever do. God can speak to you on a level that he cannot speak to any other creature. Have you ever heard that? Think about that. He can speak to you and you can hear it. You can know it. You can know God in a way that nothing else can know him. If you've been born again, he's already given you the earnest of the inheritance, that Holy Spirit of God. He's written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. He sealed you with the Holy Ghost. If you really know him today, he's put something inside you that you cannot deny. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know the Holy Ghost, he's in you. He changed you. He put joy in you. He gave you power over sin. Amen. Glory to God. The power of his person. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How did it have been to be standing there that day? Notice what it says in the Bible. They sat down and they watched him there. My, the morbid curiosity. Can you imagine? Can you imagine watching a man suffering on a cross of crucifixion, dying on that cross, 
writhing in pain and sorrow. My, can you imagine? Oh, boy. Imagine where I've been today. I've been down to the crucifixion. Boy, it was a sight to see. Yeah, I see. A sight to see. But you don't have a clue what it was about, do you? They sat down and they watched him there. Don't you notice something about this cross, the power of its identity? Philippians chapter number 3 and verse 18. From any walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even with weeping that they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now think about this for a moment. They don't come out publicly state they're the enemy of Christ or his cross. Well, how do they do it? They do it through their preaching. If you leave Christ out, the apostle says, I came not unto you to church at Corinth, knowing anything among you but Christ and him crucified. He said, I didn't come to baptize. I came to preach the gospel. Yes. Hallelujah. Right. Forever separating the gospel of Christ from water baptism. Yes. Water won't save you, folks. Yes. But he said, I'll preach Christ and him crucified. And the church at Corinth needed it because the church at Corinth had some big time problems. If you've ever read First and Second Corinthians, you'll know they had a lot going on at the church at Corinth. But then don't you look at the victory of the cross. He didn't die in vain. He didn't die to establish another religion. Oh no, my friend. He died to join man and God together in a way that only he could do. In Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. How graphic. <laughs> Can you get more graphic you see, notice, this, 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 this is a figure of speech. Because literally, there was no, the, the law wasn't hanging there on that title. This, no, it wasn't there. What had, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. This is Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews. This is what was over his head. But not the law. Yet everything the law demanded, we failed. And he nailed it to the tree. Yes. All your sins, every one of them, yes. nailed it to the tree. Yes. You couldn't see it with a natural eye, but it was there for sure. Yes. Took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The idea is, I nailed it there. Dare you try to take it down. That's the idea. Yes. It's nailed, nailed to his cross. Yes, they didn't tie him to the tree. They nailed him to the tree. So he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to it God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Colossians 2, 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or the Sabbath days. Don't you think if the apostle Paul who wrote Colossians 2 said that there is an exception with the weekly Sabbath that he would have made note of it. Don't you think so? He made it very clear. As far as God is concerned, the Sabbath has been satisfied. For Christ is our Sabbath. He is our rest, according to the book of Hebrews. Notice carefully. Don't let a man judge you in me, drink, respect of a holy day or a new moon, any of that. Whatever it may be. Hebrew roots movement. We need to learn about the Hebrew sacrifices, this and that and this and that. If you want to learn about it in a historical context, fine. Don't drag it into the gospel. Amen. It's garbage. Amen. I want to say I'm as clear as I know how to be. Anything, I don't care how well-meaning you are, I don't care how dedicated you are to it. Anything that competes with the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, my dear friend, I got no use for. It's garbage. However holy, however pious, however great it might have been, Christ satisfied every demand of the law. He is the end of the law. 
in him is the fulfillment of all that the law could never give, nor anything else give. Even the best life ever lived could never satisfy this. Christ is the end of it. And I won't accept anything less than that. The Lord Jesus Christ is everything or he's nothing. So, Exodus 25, verse 22. This is the victory. He said, there I'll meet with thee. I'll commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Now let's just look at it for a moment. The Lord Jesus is the Holy of Holies. The Lord Jesus is the high priest that stands before the Holy of Holies. The Lord Jesus is that ark of the testimony because he's the only one that could ever hold the law of God, fulfillment, the manna, and that rod that butted. All of these things could never be placed in any kind of a temporal thing and satisfied. But in Christ, they're finished. They're satisfied. He is everything that God ever demanded or ever wanted or ever needed from man. Christ is the end of it. He satisfies it. And that itself is a different message entirely. And it's a wonderful thing to think about it. When he says he is made unto us. He is made unto us. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I want you to think about that for a moment. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may tell me, preacher, are you trying to say to me that all I need is to come to the cross and I don't have to have my church? I don't have to have uh, my priesthood? I don't have to have any, uh, you know, Sanhedrin, some group of men, some this, some that? No. It's finished at the cross. It's finished there. And all you have to do is come to Christ there, meet God. And he'll do it. He'll meet you. He'll meet you at the cross. At the cross. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time we have together and the time you gave this preacher to get that word out. Thank you for this time you've allowed me to stand one more time and proclaim your word. Lord, I live for that and I'm satisfied in that and I have great joy in it. I take great joy, Lord, in being in your house and standing before you. I love this. You've been good to me. You've blessed me. May someone this morning, they've heard the message of the cross. I've preached Christ to them. He died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day for them. They've heard the gospel. May they come this morning if they don't know you. And may they come today and they accept Christ as their Savior. If they're born again and they've slipped away, they've faded off, maybe they'll want to come back today and get a good look at what you did on that tree, how you suffered and how you died. What a horrible, horrible death. But you did it all because you love us and you want that for us. In Jesus' name I pray. I don't want anybody looking, but any, would you raise your hand this morning and say, Preacher Lawson, God about gave me a vision of the cross. He just about did. It's a horrible thing. Yes, it is. But that was God manif manifesting his love for us. And it was God showing you how horrible, horrible sin is. God bless you back there. It's God showing you through the death of his son, the Lord Jesus, how seriously he takes this. It's not a joke with him. God bless you there. Not a joke. God bless you back there. Anybody else raise your hand and say, I want you to pray for me this morning, preacher. God bless you here. Anybody else? God bless you here. God bless you there. Amen. Got hands going up all over the place. God bless you there. Now let's pray. Let's pray. Father, your word, Lord, has gone out. It's not my word. It's your word. I have no power in my word. My word's nothing. But it's your word, and your word is power. It's life. And I pray for those who heard it this morning. Let them move. Let them come. Let them do something. Let them do what they need to be doing. Father, to set aside whatever may be hindering their walk with thee and come and be, at this day, be drawn nigh to thee, and you'll draw nigh to them. In your holy name I pray. For Jesus' sake, I ask it. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up here this morning.